Hello, can you hear me? Welcome everyone on behalf of Aid Society of India, People's Health Organization and CNS, Citizen News Service. I welcome you to this session uh, which is being co-chaired by the President-elect of International Aid Society, Dr. Adiba. We are waiting for her to come and it is being co-chaired by Dr. Ishwar Gilada, who is President of in the Aid Society of India and he is also a governing council member of International Aid Society. Uh, and Dr. Gilada was one of the first doctors to start HIV treatment in India when the first case was found and discovered in India. So he has a long history of being not only a physician but also an advocate. Uh, I hand over the mic to Dr. Gilada and and Dr. Adiba, please be here. Because, in fact, I'm supposed to hand over the mic to both of you because both of you are coaches. Please. Together. Thank you, Shobaji. I invite other people and then we can start. I would like to invite our other panelists, uh, Dr. Ergan Rostro. He is a governing council member of the International Aid Society. He is in his, uh, from University of Bonn and he has been well known internationally in the field of HIV, HIV hepatitis B and C co-infection, uh, Dr. Ergan. Dr. Kumar Swami, uh, he is from the VHS and he is Secretary General of the Aid Society of India. He is also well known uh, nationally and internationally in the field of HIV AIDS. Lot of clinical trials are done by him. And he has a quite a vision about HIV AIDS and what could happen to 1990 or 100, 100, 100. So I hand over uh, my mic, uh, the mic to um, Adiba. Adiba uh, is uh, president elect of International Aid Society. She is from um, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. And uh, I would first request her to brief on our theme, and then uh, other panelists can. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to this uh, morning's press conference on achieving 100, 100, 100 and zero HIV transmission. Um, I think, um, so while different countries are at different levels of achieving AIDS target, 90% um, of these are on ART and 90 of these who receive ART are virally suppressed, uh, I think um, we also need to set the target uh, higher and um, this is the, the purpose of this session to see if we can set the target even higher to 100, 100, 100. Um, and we would like to hear from our panelists um, uh, from, from Europe um, and also from South Asia and from Sub-Saharan Africa where we are in terms of um, uh, achieving these targets. So. Perhaps uh, we can listen to um, a high-income region first uh, and how they are doing with uh, getting to these targets. Jürgen? Yep. Thank you, Eva. When we're talking of high-income countries, we're not talking of me having a high income. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, and obviously, we have to separate the European region because we are talking of the European region within the European Union which is mostly high income, but also middle income. And then we're talking about the WHO European region, which is covering also some other countries. So we have a wide uh, spread with regard to economic income. The HIV situation is very different from country to country. And I think if you want to start on a positive side, I think we all appreciate that the UN AIDS goals, goals have stimulated countries to assess. And we have our ECDC, which sort of assesses the numbers, which country is doing how well. And that has helped, I think, to develop national plans, to stimulate measures which make these goals achievable. And you can see that there are some outperformers, like the City of London, which have announced in their Fast Track City initiative that they have reached 95, 95, 95, and zero discrimination. Uh, and so they are obviously leading sort of the efforts. And, and what, what can we learn from these countries and these cities? is that when you use all the tools we have, and I think that's what it's all about, and you'll hear a lot at this conference about the different new tools we have, the implementation of prevention measures, particularly PrEP. You have a session on you know, implants, other ways of delivering PrEP. All of that has contributed to 
getting people motivated to go for testing, because now you also have an intervention. They do prevention. You prevent new transmissions. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, that, that is the way forward. Um, in the context of the 90-90, if you calculate all together, you have 73% eventually suppressed. And it becomes clear that 27% are left behind. And with 27% ongoing replicating, not knowing the diagnosis or whatever, or not linked to care, that will never end the epidemic. So clearly, the targets have to be redefined. Um, and for the European region, I think this really remains a huge challenge because you have the outperformers 95, 95, 95, and then you have, in particular in Eastern Europe, in particular in Russia, much lower numbers, which has a loss to do with the fact that the cascade of care is challenged, that not everyone is linked to care, and that a high proportion of patients are not receiving ARVs despite knowing the diagnosis. So we have a huge difference uh, in, in, in that particular part of the world, which in the end makes Europe special because it's doing worse than Africa at this point. Uh, uh, and that has a lot to do, obviously, also with political issues and systems which do not allow coverance of therapy for all at this point, and that's something we all have to work on together. So in the European Aid Society, the big goal and aim currently is, is to get a much stronger involvement of colleagues from the East, um, and that you know, means that at our conference in Basel in November, we're going to have Russian translation. We have implemented a lot of sessions around uh, the challenges in Eastern Europe. We have invited a lot of colleagues from those regions to participate in the organizing committee and steering committee, because I think we, it's the time where we have to talk to people. We can't just describe what the problems are. We also have to get them on board and try to see which models are working very well and how can we sort of extend successes which have been obtained in certain parts of Europe how can we make that happen in the other parts as well? Thank you, Jürgen. Um, do we take questions at the end or? No, uh, let, let everybody the panel. Okay, okay. all right. So perhaps we can hear from Kumar um, from India, where um, I think the response has also been mixed. India is a very big country. Um, yeah, please, Kumar. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, and I work as an infectious disease uh, clinician in India in taking care of patients for the last almost like 23 years now. So what we see in India is we have 2.1 million people being estimated to be living with HIV based on our own national figures. And it has been estimated around 1.1 million people currently receiving treatment. So that means out of the 2.1 million, we have 1.1 million linked to treatment. We still don't have, uh, you know, viral load measures. Uh, it's not been uniformly implemented, you know, throughout the you know, country, despite we have all these biomedical tools available. So there's a challenge uh, in India being now, we have all the tools available, you know, India being the land of uh, generic drug manufacturers, all these medications have been available, and we do have all those necessary technologies, but still we need to find the, you know, rest of the people who are not, you know, linked to, you know, care. So I think here comes uh, how scientists work uh, very closely with the communities and as well as the you know, political activists so that you know, this can be achieved to get this uh, uh, 100 by 100 by 100 and as well as uh, zero HIV transmission in India. But we, we face a lot of challenges to achieve this. So I won't say that you know, India has not done, we have done enough. You know, we have come from almost like 50,000 people linked to treatment you know, a few years back now to 1.1 million, which is, a, which is a large, but still a country being huge, it's, it's like a typical, like a continent, you know, where we have different cultures, different languages, and different economies, so, and different, you know, political uh, activism you know, happening in the country. You know, it's, it's not that easy to uh, find everyone. So today, one of the major challenges, you know, we find is how to find these uh, hard to reach population, especially injecting drug users where the epidemic is still rising in India, and MSM, especially among young people, and as well as un under the transgender community. So, so this is something, a huge challenge we have been facing them, you know, to find this population, get them tested, and, you know, link them to treatment. And as you all know, India, you know, HIV, you know, is st still a big taboo, you know, sex talk being a big taboo, and talking anything about HIV, in the social sector is a huge uh, you know, taboo. So coupled with this culture and with these, all those challenges what we face, still we need to do a lot of work you know, to achieve you know, this goal of uh, 100 by 100 by 100. It's definitely been possible. So, and also the other 
uh, important in our message, we need to get to this uh, population to get them to linkages and as well as for retentionists to get these safer drugs. Now, today we talk about uh, you know, Daltegravir uh, for, uh, for everyone. You know, yesterday we had this WHO guideline being launched and it's been part of this guidance even since last year. So uh, these drugs have been manufactured in India, so available through uh, generic companies, been uh, you know, taken by you know, very few number of patients, but still not implemented by our national programs. Here comes how we can give this safer antiretroviral drugs so that we'll have this population come to them, you know, to us for treatment so that we'll have better retention on them. So I think still a lot of work to be done. Yeah, here comes how scientists in India, clinicians in India, need to work very closely with the communities, with the NGOs, and with the politicians to get this possible. It's possible, but still we need to do a lot of work you know, to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you, Kumar. And uh, perhaps we should listen to Koresha next and uh, the situation in Sub-Saharan Africa, in particular South Africa. Thanks very much, Radhima. So I'm from, Southern, uh, I'm from South Africa, and I think uh, most of you are aware, Southern and Eastern Africa is home to 54% of the global burden of infection. And this is also where most of the new infections are taking place. Um, South Africa has less than 1% of the global population, but is home to one in five new infections in people living with HIV. So it's a disproportionate burden. We've learned a lot about um, the transmission dynamics in terms of who is infecting who. And um, it's, South Africa has one of the largest treatment programs we have nearly five of the seven and a half million people uh, have been initiated on treatment. Um, what's significant, I think, is despite us um, having one of the largest programs, we are not seeing the population level prevention benefits at this point in time. And, uh, and one of the reasons for that is the two most vulnerable um, populations, the young women and men, don't typically utilize the health services. And so most of our, our treatment is being provided at, uh, within health facilities. And uh, it means that we're missing out some important groups. And I think uh, the, the importance of who you are putting on treatment, who you're missing, uh, is very apparent when we look at the Botswana data where they've been able to achieve 90, 90, 90, but the incidence rate has been over 3%. And one of the reasons for that is, um, is who they include when you count 90, 90, 90, and it's who's being reached and who's not being reached. Um, the other source of uh, in important information in terms of guiding us uh, to getting and doing better is the three large uh, test and treat trials that were done in different parts of um, Eastern and Southern Africa, the SEARCH trial, the ANRS trial, actually it's four, it's the Botswana trial, and more recently the pop art study. So from these um, four trials, we've been able to see how with um, very concerted effort, they've been able to reach or get close to the 90, 90, 90 targets, but again, very little impact on incidence rate, except for one arm of the pop art study, and there was a fairly modest 30% um, impact. Uh, and, and what we're starting to understand is that when we test, we are missing individuals who've been recently infected. So if you're recently infected with current um, tests that are being used to identify infection, you're not picking up those individuals during the acute infection phase. And so if we, what we know about acute infection is viral load is highest. So transmission is high, and it's offsetting some of the gains from those who we know are positive and initiating. So there's a sort of um, critical gap in terms of when somebody gets infected, high viral load, and when we be able to identify it with the systems that we have. So I think uh, in this generalized hyperendemic epidemic settings in Eastern and Southern Africa, it's becoming clearer that that even if we reach 100, 100, 100, we're going to have to meet this testing gap 
uh, where we're missing acutely infected individuals, and that can only be addressed through combining uh, our uh, treatment um, efforts with PrEP and, and other prevention modalities uh, so that jointly we can get to that point where uh, we see these substantial reductions in new HIV infections, which ultimately is the goal and what we need to be getting to to end AIDS as a public health threat. Thank you. Can you present one? What is the achievement in Malaysia? Well, perhaps um, before I hone down also on Malaysia, IS. on on perhaps if I could expand it to the region, the, the Southeast Asian region, I think very much like Europe, it's um, diverse. Uh, there are countries that are doing very well, such as Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia. But there are also countries like my own and Indonesia and the Philippines, um, where we are not uh, getting very close to the 1990 targets, let alone um, the 100, 100, 100 targets. And, um, I think the concern in uh, Southeast Asia as, uh, as a whole is that um, the decline in new HIV infections um, have somewhat plateaued. Whilst there was, uh, in, in, you know, like in most parts of the world, we were seeing a reduction in new infections, but in the last few years that, uh, that, that um, achievement has somewhat plateaued and it's not um, improving. So um, the main issues in the uh, Southeast Asian regions is most of the infections are among key populations and different countries have different um, key populations that are at risk. Uh, in my own country, Malaysia, we had um, in, in the early parts of the epidemic, um, uh, 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 the um, the infection was mostly amongst people who inject drugs, uh, but after the introduction of harm reduction, we've uh, been successful in, reverse, in reversing that. And now what we're seeing in Malaysia and in many countries in the region is uh, a big rise in um, MSM-related uh, infections. So um, the focus for different countries have, you know, obviously the prevention efforts uh, as well as um, reaching people for treatment. Uh, has to be tailored to uh, the um, nature of the epidemic in, in, every, in, in each country. So there's no one size fit all. Um, but what is clear is that uh, as a region, we seem to be lagging behind um, uh, the, the sub-Saharan African region, given um, even f um, you know, the uh, economic status of many of our countries. So much work still needs to be done. Um, and the role of IS, and, and particularly uh, myself uh, taking on the uh, president-elect role is, to, I hope, to shine the, um, the spotlight uh, a little on um, Asia as a whole, um, but Southeast Asia, the problems we're facing in uh, reaching those targets. Uh, basically, when we discuss about 1990 and 100-100-100, uh, as Ergen said, mathematically, even if you achieve all targets of 1990-1990, it becomes 73% achievement. And in 100, 100, 100, it becomes 100 percent achievement. So there is no role of complacency when we talk about 100 percent achievement. Now we'll look, we look at what is achieved by India. Out of 2.1 million, only 1.4 million people know their status. So there we are only 65 percent achievement. So if we talk about 1990, 90, and if there is a 10 percent lag everywhere, it becomes only 50, 48 percent achievement. In medical science, if 50 percent less than 50 percent, you fail. So actually, we are at that stage. We are failure, failing. Uh, the entire world's eye, eyes are on India because India has been instrumental in providing antiretroviral at pittance of the cost globally. 92% of the people uh, living with HIV AIDS, they are accessing Indian medicine. However, India is not able to use that. For example, TLD or Dolutegavir based regimen is available all over the Africa. They are already switched on TLD for one year, two year, three year. Uh, in the line, but India, we don't even look at whether it will happen next year or not. So we are not able to access or uh, provide the best possible medicines which are made in India for the rest of the world. The major problem what we see currently is uh, we are lagging behind in prevention efforts, which were very powerful about 10 years back. Currently, a lot of people, uh, those who were young children at when the uh, prevention campaigns were at peak, they are now grown up. 
but that they are uh, not having any information. So when our government system moves to the next program, uh, where uh, the uh, current program or uh, emphasis is on care and support, they are forgetting about what has to be done in prevention, intervention. So currently, prevention and intervention programs are weak. And though India has been independent for 70 years, we are left behind that British legacy. We need somebody else from outside to come, impress upon our governments and our people to tell what is your problem. So I think our role here is making IS, uh, impressing upon our government through our National AIDS Conference, which are going to have about four months after in November. Uh, at that time, President and Adiba, President-elect, both are coming. So I think we'd like to impress upon the government. Unfortunate part is at such a big conference also, we don't see our top government officials or top functionaries or top policy makers coming here and taking some lessons from here. So I think uh, India and Asia Pacific in general have a great deal to learn from Africa. We, are, we were looking at Africa as liability about 10 years back. Today that has become asset. So experiences from Africa will become lessons for us. And there, therefore, we would like uh, uh, this panel has uh, Africa, Asia Pacific, Europe. So I think we have to learn from each other and see how best we can achieve. Uh, as uh, Kumar said, that viral load testing is minuscule available in India. Out of 1.1 million people, this year they are going to make 110,000 uh, viral load to be made available through public program. So only 10% people who are on ART will get viral load in one year's time. So we are lagging behind uh, tremendously. Uh, I, I think uh, these are good goals to make but uh, very difficult to achieve for a country like India, which is a diverse population. And even mother-to-child transmission, that is easiest to achieve 0 percent. We are not able to get that. Uh, 67,000 uh, uh, children were born last year with HIV, despite having all the knowledge. So uh, now it is floor is open for your questions. And Hi, good morning. I'm Ishdeep uh, Kohli from uh, School of Public Health in Jodhpur, India. My question is uh, from, for India, for Dr. Kumar Swami and Dr. Gilada, as you mentioned, you know, uh, as by, by the new UNAIDS report, communities need to be empowered. But again, what we spoke yesterday also at the press conference, HIV in crisis and funding limitations. So how do we go about getting the funds to empower the community? And the political commitment, how do we get that? How, how do we get the parliamentarians on board? And one more area which you know you can throw some light on, taking the Pakistan example, what is happening there. So it's, it's something scary to see you know, what has happened there can easily be happening in India, where there are no universal safety guidelines for injection use. And uh, so what are the precautions, or how do we deal with that? That, that same scenario doesn't happen in India. Thank you. Right, you know, thank you for the question. I think uh, one of those, you know, to, you know, this is a challenge actually in India, I mean, not today, you know, for years now. So from Age Society of India, what we do is we do an annual conference where we educate uh, clinicians uh, throughout India, not only just practicing clinicians, but other uh, healthcare providers. Also we involve the communities and NGOs, give them a lot of uh, treatment literacy about what's newly available. In fact, this year, IAS Educational Fund is uh, partnering, you know, with ASI to do a larger meeting to involve the communities, Pan India, and as well as NGOs, to so sensitize this issue. And again, you know, we keep doing this, you know, for the last 20 years, you know, we do have meetings and we involve all the key stakeholders, but we need to continuously do this in a sustainable way because we are a country being so huge and our uh, diversity is huge. And we cannot achieve this uh, in a day or so. You know, we need this, and we have got a newer generation coming up. You know, clinicians and NGOs who have been involved in this work for 20 years they are moving away because, as you rightly said, about lack of funding. We need sustainable funding. You know, I think this has to be achievable. But on the other hand, we need to do it. You know, everybody have to step in. You know, as said by Dr. Gillard, in a huge conference like this, you know, we have a huge absence from our ministry and from our national program, you know, I think it's something where we need to sensitize some, even uh, to take some big messages from such conferences back to our country for prevention efforts. I think uh, in the last couple of years, even key populations are changing in India. We were not looking at uh, homosexuality or bisexuality as a big problem, but currently the newer cases are coming in from that community. 
Secondly, uh, the government of India has done two good things in the last one and a half year. One is HIV AIDS uh, Bill 2017, which makes discrimination punishable by uh, six months to two years, whether the medical community or whether anybody from society discriminating against HIV positive person. So I think th that uh, till today nobody has been penalized. But uh, having a law itself is a good deterrent to uh, people who are going to discriminate. Secondly, uh, Section 377 is repealed. So homosexuality is no more a crime in India. Even earlier period also, uh, hardly any uh, criminalizations were done, any cases were registered. In whole, maybe 10, 20 years of history or 30 years of history, hardly four or five cases are there. But making that, uh, repealing of that act, uh, it makes people to come out. That is a possibly one of the reasons that more and more people from the uh, gay community or homosexual community, they are coming out uh, and getting tested and getting uh, information or uh, coming for PEP or PrEP. The third most important thing is uh, the focus uh, which was there earlier, that, as I said, that has to be redone again. Uh, intervention should not stop. Intervention should continue. Because uh, well, the moment they take holiday, there are more and more cases coming up. In last four, five years or ten years, we're seeing more and more STDs which are uh, which were extinct almost. They are coming back. We are seeing a lot of herpes. We are seeing HPV. We are seeing a lot of uh, 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 syphilis. Syphilis has become rampant in uh, uh, our uh, new uh, cases which we are diagnosing with HIV. Uh, similarly, hepatitis B. So I think we have to focus on not only on HIV but HIV, hepatitis, and uh, other STDs also. Uh, people were, were forgotten. Those which, uh, like me, uh, be, uh, become uh, because of skin and STD specialty, I came in HIV. A lot of people have forgotten STD because STD was not available. Even for MD exam, we are hardly getting any STD cases to present to the students. But now STD is coming back. So I think a lot of things are changing and uh, things would continue to change. But we have to keep uh, pressure on uh, our government system, both executive as well as the political machinery. I just wanted to comment on the Pakistan outbreak. I think you, you have a very good point. Um, you know, whilst we aiming high with the 100, 100, 100, there are some pockets of uh, places where even basic um, universal uh, precaution uh, is not available. So um, the IAS actually um, has at the last minute uh, put together a session on uh, the Pakistan outbreak, uh, what we can learn from it together with uh, outbreaks in the US and Cambodia. I know it's on Wednesday, but I can't remember exactly when it is. Um, but do come and uh, you'll, you'll be able to hear the latest about the uh, Pakistan outbreak. Uh, I'm Shobha uh, from India. And I'm very glad to see two women panelists here with us today. I speak from the point of view of a woman. We have a new drug which has been announced with a lot of fanfare for women. We have a lot many existing tools also. And we are aiming for more research uh, uh, in for getting new tools to end the AIDS epidemic. But what about the existing tools? What about this new medicine which has been announced? When and how is it going to reach the women? Uh, that is the question and uh, I'm also very happy that our president-elect is a woman and I am expect I think uh, it has raised my expectations because in a country like India and maybe there are other countries in this in the Asian region where women's health seeking behavior is very very poor she's supposed to look after the health of the others and not her own also one more comment I would like to make well I have been speaking to I've been going to uh, ART centers in my city, speaking to women, and I found strangely that women who were uneducated, who came from villages, they said, yes, we are quite fine with it. They were positive women. Uh, we, we, we know much about it, and we, don't, we, we are not hiding anything. One reason was, one said, in the whole village, almost every house has a positive person. So it, it's quite okay with us. Whereas in the upper stra strata of society, in the so-called elite people, there is still a lot of stigma attached to that. But I would like you to refer to what is, where are women in this rollout of new technology and existing technologies? Karisha, did you want to take that? Or? Yeah. 
So, uh, so I think uh, I, I was just conferring that you're referring to dollar tetrapod yes, yes. and not the annual uh, implant. The Merck well, was to, uh, well, they are also there, but that announcement today was about dollar tetrapod. Sorry. Uh, yes. So we had this cluster of cases of neural tube uh, defect, and the sort of um, immediate response was let's ex exclude women from this. And I think there's better appreciation, one, especially with new data, that there's no reason to exclude women from access to that drug combination. And uh, that it's important to appreciate that not all women are going to fall pregnant and that we can combine. I think it's a good example of how, how can we combine uh, HIV treatment or prevention with other needs women have in terms of sexual reproductive health. Um, so from what I can see in Africa, certainly they didn't even wait for this new data, the guidelines to come out. They decided uh, several countries to just proceed with the rollout. And, and Botswana data is saying that, uh, they, uh, that there haven't been more cases. Um, there's been some discussion about inclusion of folate in women um, of reproductive age, and there's more counseling, and I, that's as much as I can share in terms. I think the mo most important one for you is that they're not excluding women from this first-line regimen. Your first line. Right, so coming to this question on daltegravir, you know, it has been discussed in India among the guidelines committee for the national program. So they have adapted this, you know, last year when the earlier guideline was launched, but that TTG signals in pregnancy, you know, happen all those enthusiasm. But now with the new announcement here yesterday, I think there will be a newer discussion will happen. Currently, DTG has been available even to women in, in private sector in India, but not in the public sector where a large number of women are getting okay, treatment. I think another advocacy, you know, with the government, by the women groups, which again we intend to do, you know, soon after this meeting through ASI is how these treatment will be available to women in India. Uh, uh, basically, what we are experiencing at micro level, we have been seeing all along. Discrimination and stigmatization is directly proportional to the eliteness or education. More the educated people, more they will be stigmatizing, more they will be creating discrimination. And that is somehow, uh, is not merely because of uh, uh, lightness or education, but because of the uh, socio-economic diversity and uh, upbringing uh, like carpet culture, above the carpet very clean, below the carpet fine dust. So, uh, hushes matter. And because HIV is linked to sexuality. If it was not linked to sexuality, people are not ashamed about talking about diabetes or hypertension or uh, cancer. Uh, anybody in a family, in a big person, somebody dies of cancer, they make a hospital in the name of that person, so and so cancer hospital. But nobody makes HIV hospital, nobody makes HIV clinic. So be, this, all this stigma is because of, it is sex, sex link. And probably in next couple of generation also that stigma will not go away. And if I could touch on the role of women in, in science and research, um, one of the reasons I was late was because um, I was hosting a, a women in science at the IS uh, speed mentoring effort that we um, were testing this year. We paired or we, we invited young scientists to meet um, IS female governing councils and others in leadership. I was and there too. You were there too. <laughs> we, we <laughs> and I think we had a very successful. Um, session and hope to continue this at other conferences. Um, and also, as you heard at the opening session yesterday, um, for this conference, there are more women presenters than there are men. So it's taken, what, 30 years? Uh, but we, we're getting there. And uh, we are hoping to do more programs to encourage more women in science. No, women are everywhere. In all competitive exams in India, uh, in medical science, out of 160 are uh, girls, uh, in, uh, even uh, administrative exams, now uh, this time girls are uh, uh, more than uh, uh, boys. So I think you are doing well. Not in the workforce, <laughs> but... It will happen, it will happen. Workforce. Things are changing. In the yeah, workforce and also in terms of, yeah. Thank you so much for your comments. My name is Rubita. I'm with Science Speaks, which is the blog of the Infectious Diseases Society of America. So I have a question for Dr. Uh, 
Gilada, you had mentioned that um, India is manufacturing the best generic drugs and supplying to the rest of the world, but you're not able to access those drugs in India. So could you please explain why that is exactly? Um, and I have an, another question, if I may. Um, uh, this is related to TB. Um, Prime Minister Modi has committed to ending the TB epidemic in India in the next five years. And I'm wondering um, how HIV and TB co-infection factors into that. Um, are there efforts uh, for scaling up, you know, TB prevention among people living with HIV, for example. So your basic question is TB prevention? No. Two um, questions. TB. Accessing generic drugs. Access to? Yeah, so why is India producing all the drugs but not drugs. having them available for the people living there? Exactly. So you're producing the generics. But Which is the no, no, the, the, no, no. The obstacles are basically uh, in a huge country like India. It is all decided by the government system. We are all, a uh, lot of experts involved in the uh, decision making. Like Kumar is involved in uh, a, a, a kind of government uh, committee where Dolute uh, should be part of the program. Even though uh, uh, in philosophy or uh, in technically they uh, agreed, but they said that our procurement will take more than one year. So once they start up uh, uh, global tendering, uh, though it is a national program, it is called global tendering. It will take more than one year. So, and sometimes they may have already procured medicines required for next one year or one and a half year uh, with whatever guidelines were there like TLE. They procured already. Even though some of the medicines are not to be in, in program like Nevirapine or Zodovidin or D40, they are still, the, those stock, they are taken at some places, they are still providing those medicines. So, for us, it is very difficult. Initially, we were always hidden uh, 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 logarithm with the government. But now we, we know that just being logarithm with the government is not going to help. So we are trying to impress upon government people, making them part of our uh, program or conferences. And by that way, some of the things are happening. So if we compare what is happening now as compared to four or five years back, things are changing. And uh, in a, a huge country like India or democracy, what happens is, when there were elections, our entire health department also get uh, involved in election and machinery. So, a lot, five, six months, nothing would happen. Neither at NACO, nor at health ministry, nor at ICM, nothing would happen. Because all of them are involved with either uh, everything is stand, uh, standstill or they are involved with the election machinery. So, it, it, it is a very tricky situation. And then there are some states which are uh, very poor performing. So, entire country's data will be uh, polluted because of such poor performance uh, uh, states. So, a uh, lot of diversities are there, a lot of issues are there. We are also trying to understand and impress upon them. And uh, not top level people would be interested in working in the AIDS department. So, sometimes we see that uh, uh, it's kind of a punishment posting. Somebody is to be adjusted to so put him in AIDS department. That is also happening. And that is happening for a long time. And all these kind of postings are depending on budget. If budget of particular department is low, people are not interested. And uh, if, if you look at that, health budget is very poor. It has uh, climbed from 0.3% to 1.7% now. But still it is not cross 2%. Where we would like to see health budget should be 3 to 5%, 6%, but it is not happening. So those issues are there and I think all of them make uh, this whole issue so complex that <laughs> Despite being in the field of HIV years for 35 years, we cannot understand fully. And there was another question about um, ending TB in India and yes. what is the role of TB right. HIV? Yeah. yeah, maybe I can respond to this. This is a huge campaign taken by the government to end TB. So India, you know, being a huge, uh, high prevalent to TB, you know, which you all know. So now there are several efforts been underway by the government, by several international NGOs, the Clinton Foundation, Clinton Health Access Initiative, they have launched a huge uh, TB free, uh, you know, cities um, in Chennai, Mumbai, and Calcutta, they have already launched certain programs there. And Indian National TB Program is working closely with, uh, particularly with the private doctors, um, notifying TB patients and uh, tracing their contacts and giving IPT. You know, these type of efforts are underway. It's not going to, again, end TB, you know, soon. It's going to take a lot of time. And your critical question on, you know, coupled with HIV, you know, how you're going to do this. Now, today, a lot of such programs are happening very well in the HIV community, especially to prevent TB. You know, we are implementing IPT, 
and uh, doing routine uh, screening for tuberculosis for all HIV infected people, irrespective of the symptoms and uh, you know, putting them on the appropriate treatment. But in the general population, especially non-HIV community, it's very hard to reach, especially for testing for TB and linking to the TB program and for uh, achieving the completion rate and the cure rate. You know, I think this is going to be critical, kind of like it's so huge and diverse it's going to take. But there are a lot of efforts underway to have a you know, TBP program. And our uh, government has been very positive on this campaign. In fact, the Prime Minister himself came to these meetings and launched this huge campaign. Now he's taken up you know, in a huge way. So we hope uh, this will end TB in India. Uh, Fred Schacht with HIFARA TV in the United States, Portland. We, uh, I, I've, over the years, I've been here at many conferences, 20-some conferences, and I've always seen that it seems to boil down to res personal and civic responsibility to health. And if we, if we go there, it gets to be complicated. Uh, the people who are going to be responsible are always going to be responsible in all respects. But you have people who are looking at, <coughs> excuse me, the complexity of what we're living with in dealing with prevention and the pre prevention methods and also treatment and treatment methods. Uh, if we had a cure, everybody would be banging a pathway to the door. And uh, maybe that's what it's going to take to get to zero. But uh, it, in the meantime, I think if we spread the word that this is like the cure. What we're dealing with today, what we have today is like the cure. And like you, it, it's, it's possible to do this. So if we can impress more and more people about that, I think that would be the solid message uh, to get to the uh, less served or, or uh, the uh, invisible populations that are in all the communities in different ways. You've all explained that every population, every ethnicity, every country is different. Uh, but you have to find those ways to get into those populations. Sometimes it's just being trendy, but otherwise it's just being uh, clever and ways to get out messages that are like, for instance, this is just like a cure. It isn't a cure, but it's like a cure. The cure will come. In the meantime, don't let your life fall apart because uh, a life with AIDS is still no better <coughs> if you're untreated uh, 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 today than it was at the beginning. So that's important to know. We need to get those messages out. Yeah. Does anyone wish to comment on that? Yeah. I don't know if I've it's, uh, I think it's a good point, yeah, to, to kind of, you know, because sometimes outside of the, our world, outside of the HIV world, you know, you speak and people say, oh, you know, people can live with HIV, they can lead a normal um, lifespan. So, the, you know, we, we're still not very good at getting the message out there to the whole general public um, is one. And number two, I think your point to... Um, kind of almost peer pressure between countries, you know, like, like in Asia, for in, in my region, for instance, you've got um, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, um, middle income to, to high, well, middle income with, with uh, Thailand and, and um, sort of lower income with Vietnam and Cambodia, able to achieve uh, close to 90, 90, 90, PEPFAR and uh, Global Fund notwithstanding, but you know, with a weaker health system than, say, my own country, with a much stronger health system, and yet we're we're not um, anywhere near the 1990-90. So, I think having that um, kind of peer uh, uh, country comparison is also very important. Yeah. So, if I may just add, I think that the issue of messaging is critically important. But I think that a barrier that we have in some of our countries where certain behaviors and occupations are criminalized is how do you reach those populations? So there's the one issue which is around the binary that we categorize people as male, female, and, and yet there's a whole continuum of sexual ident uh, and gender identity. And it's those individuals in those non-binary type uh, classifications uh, who we're leaving behind. And I think the point about community engagement, particularly in those key priority populations, is, is critically important mm -hmm. because there's safety there, there's knowledge. And I, like specifically in India, I was wondering to what extent the repeal of the same-sex relationships 
for example, that that was really led by activism from mm. from certain communities, and and how do you maintain that social movements uh, in terms of integrating HIV treatment risk and 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 being mm. some of uh, the conduits for the type of messaging you're talking about? Thank you. Yeah, just I just want to add one one thing, uh, and, and that is that. Uh, I appreciate that we need, you know, a strong messaging. I think that the U equals U campaign is probably the strongest message around mm -hmm. that whole issue because it has given the perspective of being undetectable, not being transmitting to anybody else, and that has changed, I think, the overall perception also for the general society. But we're living in a world where political environments and societal issues <laughs> determine a lot of the people who don't go forward for testing. And if we have countries in Eastern Europe where gay men are brought into concentration camps or killed, it's very difficult for people to come forward and identify and say, I have a risk. And the mm -hmm. same is true for IV drug use. If IV drug use means you are going to end up in a prison where the rate of hepatitis C and HIV is tenfold higher and your risk of getting infected there is very high, then we're never going to end anything. And, and so the problem is creating a general acceptance of different sexual preferences, lifestyles, and combat decriminalization of criminalization. And, and, and if you think of the, you know, the Fast Track City Initiative, it's all in the context of zero uh, criminalization. And, and, and I think that's one of the biggest obstacles which remains in many countries an, an issue, including European countries. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I think um, we've, we've come to a close. Um, thank you very much to all the panel. I think we've had a rich discussion. Um, listening to the successes in, in some regions and there's still um, uh, enormous amount of work that needs to be done in um, many other countries. Uh, there's a bureaucracy in India, there's criminalization in, in regions like my own. Um, uh, for us to uh, get to 100, 100, 100, or even 90, 90, 90. So thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you. Just one information. The session was webcast. That webcast is by the conference and live streamed by Sienna Sonson.